the bases dropped on a kind of dreary Tuesday morning here in Atlanta, Georgia, the site of the 2019 Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup Final. Luckily, there's a roof at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It could come in handy later today. We'll see how the weather goes. It's going to be a, a, a an interesting match tonight with Minnesota United coming in to face Atlanta United in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup Final. We're going to get you set for that this morning. We're going to also look back at all the action from the weekend in Major League Soccer, which was bountiful. There was a lot of it. And we'll get ready with all of the other news, rumors, things going on. Lots of news nuggets popping off today. It's it, it's an interesting time in the calendar, John, as we are getting into the playoff push for Major League Soccer. We're about to head into an international break, so you have some national team things firing off with players getting called in who should get called in we've had coaching changes it's it's a busy time at the moment and when you look at all of that going on you also have a cup final tonight the part of the calendar year where you have to kind of keep your head on a swivel and almost make sure that you've got your favorite writing device and utensil on your desk of choice just to kind of keep up with things or make your notes seeing i just said how old i was by doing that notifications yeah. on uh, social media and all that kind of stuff for your your favorite outlets for these kinds of things and so there's a there's a lot of stuff going on you got to keep your head kind of locked in as to what you're looking at and just don't be surprised if other things go down at the same time but yeah nothing like having in the middle of a season in the business end of the schedule as you phrase it Nothing like chasing after yet another trophy, and it just happens to be here at uh, SDHHQ. If you're not up on kind of what this means tonight, let, let's lay it out on a couple different levels. This tournament started in 1914. The Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup is the oldest trophy in the United States when it comes to soccer. One of the oldest in the world. And beyond the history, beyond that prestige, the winner goes into the CONCACAF Champions League. That's a big deal. $300,000 in prize money to the winning team. Runner-up gets 100000 The players are going to get the overwhelming bulk of that. This tournament has a lot of cachet. I think a match like what we'll see tonight in front of what should be the largest crowd for an Open Cup final in its history, with a fan base like Atlanta United and a fan base like Minnesota United. I, I think it's set up to be a good match on top of just everything else around it and all the importance of it. This feels like it could be the year that the Open Cup truly grows up. When you go back through its history... When it started, you know, it's the early days of soccer in the United States, and, and it's all over the place. Maybe the glory days of the first run of the Open Cup were around the time the American Soccer League was a big deal. The first World Cups were happening. You had a very high level of play. When the American Soccer League faded away, this tournament became essentially an amateur tournament. The North American Soccer League teams did not participate in it. So you didn't get the New York Cosmos, the, the Tampa Bay Rowdies, the Los Angeles Aztecs. You didn't get any of them in their heyday in the old NASL playing in this tournament. It wasn't until 1995 when the A-League entered its teams into the tournament and Major League Soccer agreed to enter the tournament when they joined up in the next season in 1996 that it entered into the modern era. We've seen some upsets in, in the tournament's history, some big ones. Uh, the first big one was probably Rochester beating the, the Tampa Bay Mutiny in 1996. That turned a lot of heads. Rochester went on to win the tournament in 1999. They're the last lower division team to win the tournament. Since then, it's been all MLS. And it, it's maybe the tournament, because of the way it gets scheduled at times, because of preceding this year, the, the lack of publicity, the, the lack of you know availability of watching it and consuming it, it's been a little bit of an afterthought. 
but that has changed over the last couple of years, and it has dramatically changed, I think, this year, just because it's more accessible. Everybody can follow along what's happening in this tournament, and, and not just the New Mexico United run, not just the St. Louis FC run, where they get into the quarterfinals, but a team like the Florida Soccer Soldiers. Everybody was talking about the Florida Soccer Soldiers. Players from that team went on to get signed to professional deals, which was very cool to see. It feels like a new day for this tournament, John, and it feels like a final tonight if it delivers the way that we're expecting it to in the stands with people talking about it and with a quality of a match that the Open Cup going forward could be in a much different place and a much more important place in the hierarchy of U.S. soccer. Well, and think about, I mean, obviously the the conversations that we have when it comes to Open Cup traditionally are are a little more in-depth than a lot of folks. But to your point, where the Florida soccer soldiers were part of the landscape, the game with the villages, because it was accessible, people were talking about it and how it went to like 4,000 rounds and penalties before it was decided. The power outage out west involving one of the Orange County sides that kept that match in suspense in the early part of the second half forever. And so you had folks on the East Coast keeping an eye on what's going on on the West Coast until, I want to say, 2 o'clock in the morning Eastern time because the match was supposed to be over long before then, but it wasn't. And all of the, the lower division sides that became talking points along the way here in the Open Cup, I thought it was I thought it was cool to see folks talking about the soccer soldiers, talking about the villages, talking about Orange County SC versus Orange County FC, about New Mexico United, all of these different elements. And the accessibility, I think, really played into it. And you want to continue that momentum, not just after tonight, but, you know, yesterday we talked about on soccer over there that we had teams already announced for USOC 2020. And so I think the challenge here is that while all of this exposure was great, the added exposure is fantastic. Getting to watch as many games as humanly possible is great. I think that tonight, you have a good match. You have a, a match that can continue to work the, the pedigree of the Open Cup forward. But just take the momentum that you've built this year and continue with it going forward. And I think for me, that is, that's the, the one thing that I'm going to be looking for is the, the continued – I'm just – I don't – I have that, no earthly idea why. Yeah, but, but that's, that's, why. That's, that's, that's the thing is it is different. I, I think – we can we can stop worrying now because this exposure it's a different place like you're not going to pull back from here you know it's it's not going to you're not going to put it back in the box so w- let me ask you this then let me sure. let's take it from being negative to being positive what needs to happen for it to take an even bigger step going forward because it's not going to go backwards how can it go even further forwards frankly for me I think it's stuff that we've discussed. I think it has to do with making sure that if a local market wants to do something with a side, and and this the Atlanta United element to me seems to be the the shining example of where you can take it with the lack of over-the-air radio coverage that was available. Yes, I know that ESPN has all of the rights to all of the aspects of it, but – when you continually have a team banging on the door of Bristol, Connecticut, saying, hey, we want to do this and we want to continue to have it grow in this particular element of it and having the doorbell not answered every single time, it's disappointing. I'd like to see that change. I'd like to see you know, what we've been able to do and work our way around it. That's been great. But I think that there are ways over the air radio. I think having it over the air on the ESPN networks and not just on the plus, even though I understand why they want to do that. That's a I think that I I think that those are the two things for me that I'm looking at going forward. 
how do you address it when a team who has the fan base that Atlanta United does wants to do things to augment coverage and fix a hole in the contract or however you want to phrase it in the coverage area. Atlanta United, every possible way, 92.9 has been fantastic about wanting to do it. We want to have this on over the air radio. Yes, we know that you have the rights to it all, meaning ESPN, but we'd like to do something to fill in a gap that you do not seem to wish to address. I would like for ESPN to be a little more open-minded when it comes to over-the-air aspects of it, whether it's radio and then putting it on the news like they do with USL Championship or on one of the other families of networks, having this on the deuce maybe or something like that when it comes to the final, the semifinals being in other places other than the plus. I think that, yes, folks will be attracted to ESPN Plus, naturally so, but there's also going to be that section of the demographic that is still invested in over-the-air product. So I think that putting marquee games on the over-the-air sections of the ESPN networks, having the radio element, which ESPN isn't touching and has said nothing about wanting to touch, put that out there for local markets that want to invest in continuing to promote the Open Cup the way that it should be to continue this growth curve that it's had, especially this year, Once again, not denying what ESPN has done. It's been fantastic having all of these games on the plus. But I still think that there's a section of the audience that still believes in traditional over-the-air viewing or listening. And I think that that should be addressed as well for that particular demographic to continue to move it forward. I think there's still a mentality that if it's not over-the-air, if it's not on one of the ESPNs, it's not as big of a deal. And for U.S. soccer, this is your national championship. So it needs to be presented as a big deal. And if that's something that's coming down the road, cool. And, and it would make sense. I mean, look, ESPN Plus is, is still fairly new. You're trying to build a subscriber base. They have built their subscriber base off of soccer. Uh, now we're getting reports that they are going to pay USL um, a rights fee for a three-year deal with them to keep USL on ESPN Plus with increased games over the air, even ESPN Fantastic. Deportes. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We, we, we know how the games play, John. We know how this works. Mm-hmm. You have a new service. You want people to subscribe to it. You're going to put games there that people want to see. That's, that's business. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's the same thing they did with ESPN2 when it launched. They threw a Duke-North Carolina basketball game on there, and everybody said, well, i got to watch this game. How do I watch this game? My cable service has to have ESPN2. I'm going to call them. And that's how it started, and that's why ESPN2 became what it is. So it's how the game's played. What I hope is that going forward, ESPN Plus is the home of the U.S. Open Cup. However... Games are picked out to put on TV. I hope the final goes on TV. I hope the semifinals go on TV. I hope a quarterfinal goes on TV. A round of 16 game, a round of 32 game gets on TV. Or the flip side, and this is what I would really love to see, and ESPN, if you want to do this, just uh, just put my name in the credits, please. That's all I ask. <laughs> uh. When the tournament starts proper, do a a wraparound show oh. on ESPN News, one of the over the airs, where you are cutting in and out. Do that. Do that in the early rounds before the MLS teams come in. Put all the games on ESPN Plus, but do that wraparound show on one of your over the air networks and have fun with it. And that will be a great way to blow this tournament up. That will be something that I think we'll start to take this tournament to the next level. Um, The local radio, obviously, yes, I'm a little biased. I think that would help. I don't think that changes the overall landscape of the tournament nationwide because that's going to be certain markets are going to really blow that up and have success with it. Some aren't. It's a a nice addition, and it needs to be there. That should be a no-brainer. But other things that need to happen for this tournament, more in the way of content around it, 
Yep. Whether that's U.S. soccer producing it, whether it's the clubs producing it, it needs to be more widely available to know the stories of this tournament. For us, who we tell stories. That's what we do on the show every day. It's not always easy to find information about what's going on in the tournament. Please make that more available. If it's just amplifying what the individual clubs are doing, do that. I think we've crossed that boundary. That's why I wanted to make the point that this is not a, well, I hope the U.S. Open Cup can survive type of thing. No, we're we're way past that. It's not a, well, I hope it doesn't fall backwards thing. No, I think we're past that. But now, all that's well and good. How does it grow further, faster? Because you can keep doing what you're doing right now. Have the tournament. Have the games marketed as they are. Have your games on ESPN+. Plus. All that's good. It's going to continue to grow steadily just because people will find it and be like, oh, okay, cool. Or their team will make a run at it. Okay, that's cool. But you can blow it up bigger if it's done properly. The other thing, and I agree with what a lot of fans have said, the final needs to be on a weekend. And if that means Major League Soccer has to agree to some flexibility in scheduling to have the final on a weekend because look let's let's be real it's more than likely going to be MLS teams in the final you you'll get a USL championship team in the final again in the next five years I think that's definitely realistic but more than likely it's going to be MLS teams make it part of the tournament structure to have the final on a weekend and whatever league games need to get moved they get moved that should happen because that will, again, up the profile of this. This tournament needs to be seen as a bigger deal. The CONCACAF spot is great. The money, that's good. It could be better. Sell a sponsorship to it. Cool. Do it. But putting it on a weekend, putting it over the air on TV, those are the things that tell a casual fan, all right, this tournament's worth my time. This tournament's something I should be paying attention to. This tournament's something that I should go watch in my local market those are the that's the wish list for the u.s open cup going forward we're going to take a quick break come back and we're going to talk about tonight's match what to look for with minnesota united coming to town to face atlanta united at the bends kickoff will be at eight o'clock we'll have pre-match coverage for you on 92.9 the game starting at seven before the espn plus broadcast but after this we'll get you set for some storylines in tonight's match hang out with us we'll be right back Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois.
Welcome back. Soccer down here. August 27th, U.S. Open Cup final day at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Minnesota United come into town, and Minnesota will be playing in the biggest game in their club's history tonight. They have not made the postseason yet in their MLS run. Their NASL days, if if you want to tie in the old Minnesota Thunder into it, the USL days, all of that, not even on the same plane as where we're talking about tonight in an Open Cup final with a CONCACAF berth on the line for the Loons. How do they handle the pressure is one of the biggest questions I have. You know, how are they going to handle this if it gets tight late? How are they going to handle it if it goes to extra time? How are they going to handle it if Atlanta scores early? I don't know. I don't know if Adrian Heath knows. I, I don't know if the players necessarily know because, John, they just haven't been here before. Mm-mm. And, you know, we talk about the first 15 to 20 minutes. And in Mercedes-Benz Stadium chasing after a trophy, you're on the road. They came in yesterday, brought 24, which I thought was a nice touch. I thought it was very, very cool to bring everyone along for the ride just to kind of get everybody the the vibe of what's going on. And you come in a day early, you kind of look up, you, you get the – you get your neck figured out and make sure that your muscles don't sprain going north and south, looking at the size of the place. And then when everybody hops in, you know, how do you respond? You know, does, I think that what we've talked about is the, the key for Atlanta United. If they can jump on Minnesota United early in that first block of time, you get getting to the quarter pole, you get a, a goal up, then a lot of folks are going to be breathing easier. But I think that at the same time, I think that, you get that confidence in from either side, what happens in that up to the quarter pole. Then you let Minnesota United into the match if you haven't done anything from an Atlanta United perspective. If Minnesota United gets a goal on the board, then obviously their confidence is sky high for the remainder of the match. But there's that, that first little window for a team that's never been there before, and how do you respond? And so I think that that that's what I'm going to be looking at as we stare at this match tonight. Osvaldo Alonso has won four U.S. Open Cups. He's with Minnesota now. He won all four of those with the Seattle Sounders. He also lost two with the Battery and with the Sounders. The Battery were the last lower division team to get to this point in 2008, and Osvaldo Alonso was there before joining Seattle. He brings that experience to this team. On the other side... Atlanta United has been in knockout games before. They've won knockout games before. They also have two players who have won an Open Cup before in Michael Parkhurst and Jeff Lorenowitz when the New England Revolution won it. I don't know if that Open Cup final experience matters as much on the Atlanta side coming off of a Campiones Cup, which, yeah, we didn't really know how important that would be. Felt pretty big once that game got started. Going through that experience at a high-level match with Club America very recently will help Atlanta here. The playoff run last year will help Atlanta here in a big way. What are your concerns about Atlanta coming into tonight, John? Just general fatigue from schedule compression. And I know that we have a, a lineup possibility, even with the the international uh specifications that are allowed that you can only have X number of folks in. And I know we'll get into those, those guys in a bit when we're discussing lineups and such, but just the, the overall fact that Atlanta United has really had to play a lot of matches and you're throwing this one in here as a part of it all and where schedule compression comes in, where is everybody right now? Where is everybody's health and uh, welfare when you're looking at 90 minutes. I know we always look at Julian Gressel as a guy that really probably needs to have a, a match off somewhere. But uh, I've just pretty much thought that this was going to be a team that was going to get to the international break and then take a break. So nothing will surprise me when it comes to the lineup. But just the the overall physical wear and tear is probably my biggest thing coming into tonight. 
Atlanta's won eight of their last nine in all competitions. They've only lost one time at Mercedes-Benz Stadium this year uh, in all competitions. Um, they've only lost one time at home when you include Open Cup games and CONCACAF match at, at Kennesaw's Fifth Third Bank Stadium. They've been really good in Mercedes-Benz since the place opened. 26-5-8. and eight. One of those losses is to Minnesota, though. Late in 2017. Jarrett Smith remembers that. I think that's the game that makes yes. him the angriest uh, of anything that's happened to Atlanta United. It's that game that Jarrett is probably yelling about right now as he's <laughs> listening to the show. Um, Adrian Heath has taken all of that and definitely playing the the underdog role in a big way. And it makes sense. They are the underdog. The The, the juice box purveyors would agree with that. Matt Doyle, though, and let's remember, Adrian Heath has talked about MLS Digital putting the flag at half-mast when Minnesota won games. Uh, Adrian Heath is not a fan of, of the MLS Digital side. Matt Doyle predicted yesterday that Minnesota would win in penalties after a nil-nil draw through regulation and extra time. Hmm. Okay. I mean... It's a final. Anything can happen. I don't. I don't think it's going to be scoreless. I, I think that that's a little crazy. No. Yes. Um, could it be a draw? Could it go to penalties? Could Minnesota win? Yeah, absolutely. But I, scoreless feels like the craziest part of that. Yes. Um, looking like an estimated three hundred Minnesota United fans who've made the trip. They'll be. They'll make some noise, and I want to see how Atlanta fans respond. There's been a lot of back and forth about tickets and ticket availability and and what the deal is across the board with it. The whole ticketing process, Gwen gets riled up about tickets. as She's fired up about it. Yeah. Um, It's been weird because it's U.S. soccer handling it. One PSA from a listener, Tom Shrek. The Atlanta United app right now isn't displaying QR codes for the game tonight. Tom says you can work around that by saving the ticket to Google Pay or going to the ticket portal in your browser. So make sure you're prepared just in case things get weird on that side. It, it's been a process. I, I know the tickets went on sale to the general public later than they should have. Um, there were some issues with the season ticket holders and deposits going here, there, and everywhere. So there are tickets still available. There are good prices for tickets that are available. This is a game, if you're thinking about it, you should definitely go check out because a final atmosphere is a special one. But then on the flip side, according to uh, Doug Robertson, and we're going to talk to him in about an hour on the show, this could be, well, I think it's set to be, the largest Open Cup final crowd ever. And that number is 35,000, which Atlanta should be able to beat. So numbers, tickets have been moving I think they haven't been moving as fast as a usual Atlanta match would be. I think there will be a walk-up crowd. I want to see how all of that plays out in terms of atmosphere tonight because while it's only 300 fans for Minnesota, they're going to be trying to make as much noise as possible. And I want to see if they have opportunities to do so. For me, this game comes down to who starts the fastest. No, I'm right there with you. And I was trying to find – Lewis Martin had done the research, and he says that there's still over 2,900 non-resale tickets available right now, and this is as of 7.30 Eastern time this morning. Okay. So I don't know if that puts you at 42 that are sold, distributed, or – 37. I'm not sure how. I, I guess it would be 42. I don't know if, if all 45 in the lower bowl configuration are available. But still, I would imagine if there's only 3,000 non-resale that you're going to have folks interested in the walk-up. So I, I would anticipate that this is going to clear 35 and, and be a new record. Yeah, I think that part's easy for sure. That, yep. That's definitely going to happen. All right, let's talk about the teams on the field a little bit. Minnesota's had injuries coming in. They, they rested guys last Thursday in their last league match. Everybody is available 
for the Loons. Osvaldo Alonso says his thigh injury that's kept him out of his last two games, quote, feels pretty good. Kevin Molino's recovered from a leg injury. Angelo Rodriguez trained on Monday without any issues. So, Minnesota will be at full strength. Atlanta, everyone trained yesterday with the exception of Breck Shea, obviously, who's out for the rest of the season after surgery. Everyone else trained. Frank DeBoer did say that Dion Pereira would be the odd man out. When you look at the, the international spot issue, you can only have five in Open Cup matches. Atlanta has six internationals. I was a little surprised by that. I didn't know what Franco Escobar, Eric Rometty would have available tonight. I thought it might be one of them that is left out. But it's Pereira who's left out. So you know who the internationals are for Atlanta. When you look at the Minnesota side, it, it's a little complicated. Michael Boxall, Thomas Chacon, Jan Gregush, Robin Lord, Vito Manone, Roman Metinier, Wilfred Moimbe Tarat, and then Angelo Rodriguez. <laughs> this is on the MLS roster page. He's crossed out but then written in above i i have no idea why i've never seen that i don't know what's going on um i believe he is an international i don't think he has uh gotten a green card so i think uh moembe tarat out would make sense then you're down to seven guys and all of them are contributors chuck hone is new and he might be left out because he's just not 90 minutes compatible with this team right now is maybe the best way to put it. I think he's fit, but he's he's only played once for the team so far since being signed as a designated player. So he's a, a maybe. Beyond that, I mean, Boxall, Gregush, Manone, Metzener, Rodriguez are all first choice. Law is first choice. He's he's new to the team, but he's been playing. Started since last time. Yeah, I mean he, he's he's first choice now. He has he's a newer. You're gonna have to leave somebody not just out of the starting lineup, but out of the 18. A couple guys. I don't know how Adrian Heath handles that. That's gonna be really difficult when you look at possibilities. Um, Rodriguez would have made sense because you had other options up top. And that might still make sense. But him being back and talking about his fitness, that makes you wonder, okay, well, maybe he's going to factor in. I don't know what Adrian Heath's going to do in this regard. Yeah, okay. Quickly, just to – they uh, against Portland, you're starting 11. Manone, Metanier, Opara, Boxall, Gasper at the back. Molino, Gregish, Alonzo, Lode in the midfield. Quintero and Toy up top with a bench of Olam, Finley, Schuler, Ohmsberg, Dotson, Shuttleworth, and Dunlady. You didn't have Chacon what... at that point. You yep. didn't have Moimbe Tarat. So, I mean, th- you didn't have those guys in your team, is what I'm saying. Like, nope. this is yeah. it's a different conversation now than it was then. So, I I don't know how, you, how they're going to handle this. I really don't. Um, Box all for me is a must because you want to keep the combination of him and Opara as your center backs. Manone is a must. Gregush is a must. Metzener is a must. So that's four. Then you're down to, yep. to one spot between Chacon, Laud, Rodriguez, Moembe Tarat. My guess would be Robin Laud. I think you have other options in the other positions. Although Chacon, and it, it, this is just kind of the wild card because he's he's new to the team, he's the playmaker that you haven't really had. If you're high on him and you feel like he's he's ready to go, I would put him into the team because he's the one who could have the most impact, but he's probably the most unknown as to what that impact would be since he's just joined the team here recently. That's the challenge for Adrian Heath tonight when you look at the international spot. I know he had some questions about that. Yeah. I'll and, be fascinated to see what they do. Yeah. No, and we had, we had folks looking, wondering with the Atlanta 
lineup was going to look like with the, the five availables too. But you went through, you went through that. Well, that was answered yesterday by, by Frank. Yeah. Moore. Yeah. Some folks were posting lineups this morning, wondering about what it was going to be. Um, and Nathan Pugh did ask about internationals for Minnesota. So you picked up on that one as well. So other things to keep in mind about tonight, Minnesota, pretty balanced attack. They've got three guys who have scored five or more goals. Darwin Quintero is the leader with eight. Quintero adds six goals in the U.S. Open Cup to that total for 14 in all competitions this year. He scored in every win that the Loons have had in the Open Cup this year. Vito Minone in MLS play, nine clean sheets. Joseph has had fun against the Loons. He's got five career goals against them. Remember, he had that hat trick in the first game against them in the snow in 2017. Atlanta leading scorer in the Open Cup, Open Cup hero Brandon Vasquez, he's got four. The team scored ten in their Open Cup run. And this was the the stat of the day from, uh, I'm assuming this has got to be uh, Johannes Schneider with Atlanta United, who, who dug into this one. This is great. <laughs> so, since 1992, there have only been six first-year managers, first year with their club, to win the U.S. Open Cup. It hasn't been done in a long time, actually. The last one to do it is Dave Sarikin with the Chicago Fire in 2003 to win the Open Cup in your first year with the club. Cool little bit of history there, potentially for Frank DeBoer. Mm-hmm. And you know, just think about you know, what DeBoer has traditionally said: you need you need six months. And now that we're past that six month mark, we've seen what Atlanta United can do. And now you're facing. Do we? Would we officially call this a double? If they win, tonight? I would. If they win tonight and they win, then we're talking just between this and Campione's Cup? Yeah. Yeah, I would. So it's, you, you the, have the games like Campione's Cup are, are weird, and some people will count them, some people won't. I would because you earned it. You know, you earned it playing in that match because it was a match between champions. You're a champion. I would count it. It's a different type of double. It's a much lesser double. But if you pair Open Cup with MLS Cup, well, then that's a different conversation. It's like Community Shield. Would that be the equivalent for Campeones? Yeah. I mean, I, community. I think the bigger one is Super Cup because you're talking about an international cup, even though it's not run by CONCACAF. It's still the, the American Major League Soccer champion. Sorry, Toronto. Sorry, Canada. And Mexico. So it's like the UEFA Super Cup. You know, it's like the the Supercopa in, in Conmebol. That's what that's the, the feel of it to me. Yeah, I was just trying to think of a competition that is just one not attached to any long running competition. The Super Cup. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. it, it, just because it's international. I mean, Community Shield is is a little different because it's just domestic. But no, okay, Super Cup, I can dig that. But yeah, I was wondering if the prevailing opinion was is that do you call this a double or not? I would, you would, and so that's I just figured I would put that out there as a question. Look, too. it's it's you know what the answer is going to be. If you follow Atlanta United, you you will say yes that it's a it's a double, it's a trophy it, it, that the Campione's Cup matters. If you don't, you'll say no, it doesn't, because it's the same thing that happened with Manchester City last year. You know, nobody wanted to to count the Community Shield for them except for Manchester City folks. So you know, it is what it is. And that's how you end up with a quad or a triple, depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. Dreaming of sweater weather with the optimism of the morning. This dreary weather reminds me of the day we won MLS Cup. It's a good day to add another trophy to the trophy case. Hashtag Tuesday thoughts. Yeah, that is true. It's it's not as cold, thankfully. No. I take that. Um, oh, that was miserable in a lot of ways. But it's not <laughs> quite there. 
so that's good. Um, we will kind of be keeping an eye on on the weather all day in terms of our tailgate show. I, I do know that Dukes and Bell will be broadcasting from the Gulch ahead of the match. They'll be down there from two to seven, broadcasting on ninety two nine the game. We will be efforting a broadcast depending on uh, weather at around five o'clock. And I know that uh, you have uh, an opportunity to parachute into Dukes and Bell. Is that accurate still? Yeah, I'll be hopping on at 440 with those guys. Daniel Price is a little busy this morning. He says he wishes he could listen into the show, but he's currently with my lovely wife about to have our anatomy scan and see our baby girl. Going to be a heck of a game at the Benz today. Ran into a couple of Minnesota United fans last night. They look ready to go. Very cool. Yeah, there's a bunch of Minnesota fans who have made the trip down. And uh, congrats, Daniel. It'll be a good day for you, for sure. Looking, I mean, I'm just looking forward to what the vibe in the building is tonight. Yeah. I, I do hope that all those tickets that are available go. I do hope that it has a, a final feel to it. And I think it will. I think once it gets underway, it's going to have that to it. I want to see how Minnesota approaches the match. I'm, I'm really curious as to how aggressive they are or if they sit back. I just don't know if Adrian Heath is is gonna have his team sit back and defend deep. I just I'm not I'm not convinced that that's gonna be their approach. Even though a lot of teams do it when they come into this building, I don't know if he's I don't know if his team has that personality. I, I was going to ask if that seemed to be a part of his calculus, and I would think over the last year that it hasn't been that way. That they've been aggressive and when you have folks like a Darwin Quintero that you're going to not want to sit there and just sit there for however long before you decide that okay let's let's get engaged and try to get something done here or try to get it to to the extra 30 minutes and then to to penalties or what have you but no I just I just don't think in the last year with everything that Minnesota has invested in that roster that it's a part of their their DNA I don't know if it's about the investment. I think it's where you've added some players because you've added Ike Opara and Osvaldo Alonso, which make you stronger defensively, which in my opinion, make it a little less likely that you'll do that because you're, you're better. You just don't, you don't have to. And in the past you did in the past, you weren't good enough to play an open game with, top opponents now you are now let's look back though at the game in late may when minnesota united came to town they came in and played a 5-3-2 if you go back and remember that they played brent coleman ike Opara, michael boxall as three center backs they played hassani dotson as a wing back he's traditionally a central midfielder played well in that match too by the way they played Miguel Ibarra as a wing back, although he was really pushed up high whenever they had the opportunity. They played three central midfielders with Osvaldo Alonso, Jan Gregus, Rasmus Schuler, two up top, Dunlady and Darwin Quintero. And it didn't really work out. They lost 3-0, um, put up a, a decent fight. But when you look at the games before and after that, you wonder, okay... Adrian Heath, looking at coming into the Benz, how much did he change? Well, they played a 4-2-3-1 the next match against Philadelphia. Uh, one issue that he did have, and this is something to keep in mind that won't be the case tonight, Roman Metinair was suspended for that match. He is available tonight. He went straight back into the lineup in their next match against Philadelphia after they came to Atlanta. Uh, that one was on June 2nd. And they went back to a 4-2-3-1 that they've played most of the season. That's the only thing that still makes me wonder is, all right, they've played a line of four. They've played a a 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3 for the most part all season long. They've only had a couple of times that they went with three center backs. One of them was against Atlanta. Do they do that again? I don't think they should. I don't think it suits them. But 
we have seen it once already. I'm I'm going to chalk that up to the lack of Roman Metzner. I'm going to chalk that up to that causing the questions of, okay, maybe I need to sit back a little bit more. I don't have my all-star right back. Maybe I need to do just a little bit more to shore things up. Didn't work. If I'm Adrian Heath, I think you go 4-2-3-1 and, and go for it. I would think so, too. I mean, I think that when you don't have someone like a Metanair, then you've got to try to figure out a different way to get done what you want to get done. And I think that that's what that was. I think, for me, that was a one-off. And I think that you're just going to – frankly, for me, I think you're going to go into this match. We are who we are. This is who we're going to be. We're going to work around the – the uh, the six for five when it comes to the international spots and just be who we are because you know if you change too much coming into a game that is going to be there for a trophy then you're kind of rejiggerifying everything and you may not need to so I I just say go in who you are don't don't change a whole lot just for that whole uh, factor of sitting there and giving somebody else something to think about just be who you are coming into a match like this all right get your questions in on the match tonight get your tuesday thoughts in on twitter at soccer down here we'll start to get to those right after this a ranger station i'd like to report a bear hug okay i put out my campfire and smoky bear hugged me so you drowned the fire you stirred it drowned it again and felt that it was cold uh-huh yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here. Tuesday Thoughts talking u.s open cup final atlanta and the loons tonight kick off at eight o'clock espn plus is the only way to watch what questions do we have john shiva with her analysis of what she thinks might be going down tonight if the legs don't get heavy and passes and finishes are crisp then we should have this game my only worry is do we have the legs to run up and down the field, specific, especially with this system we play in? I like Jeff to start today instead of Rometty. I think the thing about the system, and it's just, it is, it's a fascinating conversation as we talk about these layers to things. The system isn't built on playing 100 miles an hour, the system's honestly about control you can control the pace. You know, this is a system that you can play slower. You can knock the ball around in because you have balance. You can keep possession and play keep away. 
And that's something that the team needs to to do at times. And it's something that maybe it needs to do a little bit more at times. Because sometimes when they get into track meets, you know, it's not necessarily the best way to play that match. But the system, the philosophy, is not built on playing 100 miles an hour. That That's one thing to keep in mind here. It's something that we saw the team do more earlier, where they were a little more focused on keeping overall team shape as they advanced up the field. Now, it's been a little more about keeping the defensive shape, the defensive line, and keeping that organized, as opposed to keeping the midfield, the back line, the front line, all in a group as they advance up the field. Slow things down a little bit tonight. That might be the way to play, just because I I agree with Shiva. You might not have the legs to be able to play at that pace throughout the match. And if you're Minnesota, you would probably want to pick up the pace and make it a little bit more of a track meet because you've got some players who can hurt a team with tired legs. So then Atlanta has to do something that they, they struggled to do, I think, in the first half against Orlando on Friday night. Slow the game down. Don't play at the other team's pace. If they want to play slow, then speed it up. If they want to play fast, then slow it down. Make them adjust to you because you have the talent to do that. And you also have, I think, the, the, the style, the philosophy of being able to do either. You're not limited, if that makes sense. It, it's about like the, the, the speed you play at doesn't define the way you play. For some teams, it does. For Atlanta, it shouldn't. And hopefully, they they do a little bit better job tonight of managing that pace of the match. Tafka, discussing the four-letter, he says it devotes MAJOR, in all caps, with four A's and four O's, hours of primetime television to the freaking, in all caps, Little League World Series. The inability to promote one of the oldest sporting tournaments in our country for a sport of major interest of growth is pathetic. That is from Tafka. The Little League World Series draws ratings, dude. I'm sorry, it does. <laughs> it does. Uh, it, it it gets numbers. Otherwise, they wouldn't put as many hours to it. Could the Open Cup get numbers as well if it was promoted properly? Yeah, I, I think it could. I, I do. Um, the numbers for ESPN on Friday night with Atlanta and Orlando and Portland and Seattle were very good. They were very good numbers when you compare it to the overall world of cable on Friday night. Now, could the Open Cup do that right now? Maybe not, because the story's not there. But let's let's also go back to the what's really happening here. Let, let, let's not get it twisted. This is not ESPN saying... Well, you know, we're just going to put this game over here because we don't care. Look, they bought the U.S. Open Cup rights. They put everything on ESPN+. Plus. They blocked out local radio. All of that is to get subscribers to ESPN+. Plus. Flat out. That, that's, that's, the, that's the goal here. That's what this tournament has been used to do. We'll see next year what kind of decisions they make about where they put games, how they put games, what they do. But this year, that was the goal from the jump. So it's not it has nothing to do with Little League World Series. Zero. It it's, it doesn't matter. Drive. It, that's you're driving traffic. You're driving traffic. You're driving you're not even not even driving traffic. You're driving subscribers. And this was a tool that they felt could drive subscribers. And by all accounts, it has. They've done really well with subscribers. Chris Kilroy, in picking a 4-1 Atlanta win, says if we are in a favorable position, two-plus goals with like 15 minutes left, I'd love for Parkey to get on the field and get to lift the cup. Obviously, it's a few steps down the line, but it would be a cool situation. It would be very cool. Um, You never know how the game's going to work out, but if that is something that is possible, that would be pretty cool. It's, you know, it's part of pro sports. The, the situation that, that Michael Parkhurst is in right now. He, he has contributed a lot this season. He played some big minutes in some unfamiliar roles. 
earlier in the year where he had to just because that's that's where the team was with injury situations and he performed well but as the year has gone on as the team has evolved as they've they've you know updated and altered the way they play a little bit it's a little bit harder to fit him in i still think there will be roles for him to play down the stretch i still think he's going to be an important part of this group whether he's on the field or not but yeah his time on the field is not what it had been it would be really nice if the game works out that way to give him that possibility. But, you know, you can't force it because you just don't know how it's going to go. Tafka with a public service announcement. He says his Atlanta United app currently has his Open Cup tickets accessible. Okay, there you go. Be, be prepared if things get weird, but there you go. Cool. Four card Ahmed with a bit of a request. Can you guys just do the play-by-play anyways from your seats at the stadium, ESPN be damned? I'll be there and can have my 929 and radio app feed plugged into my ear, in all caps. Please. Hashtag no. Tuesday thoughts. We can't do that. We're, 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 we can't do that. Sorry. 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 And uh, Tafka, to your uh, thing about Little League brings ratings, he says... I see your little league brings ratings and raise you a poker tournament, bowling tournament, and competitive billiards with a winking emoji. And they bring ratings too. Yep. I mean, <laughs> Tafka, you can World wink Series emoji. Of poker? Any of it. I mean, look, Tafka, you can wink emoji all, all you want at me. I'm with you in terms of of putting more soccer on TV, but the ratings have not been as good as some other properties that are probably cheaper to produce i mean world series of poker that's been not what it used to be but it's still easy money for them easy money cornhole tournaments are easy money for them now too all kinds of stuff Uh, Uh uh-huh it's it's complicated i I think the where soccer is in TV, and man, we're getting to this right up against the break. I'm going to try to make it really quick, and we might carry it over. Where soccer is, domestic soccer on TV, it has to be taken more seriously and presented more seriously to be watched more seriously. That's one major issue I have with it. When you, your lead-in to games is, is talking about food and your Twitter preview show is on Twitter instead of on TV, things like that. Don't sell the game. And more importantly, and this is the one that drives me nuts, things like when your two games that are big games for your league sign off and the first thing that's said on SportsCenter is mocking soccer people, yeah, that's going to affect your ratings. So if you get frustrated about your ratings, if you are the network, and those are the things that are doing to diminish the product and people don't watch or you don't get out of the soccer bubble to get people to watch, well, maybe that's why. And maybe you should think about how you present the NBA, how you present college football, how you present Major League Baseball, the NFL obviously, and transfer some of that to how you present Major League Soccer. And then maybe your ratings will be bigger and it will be taken more seriously because it is being presented as a serious product. Just a wild thought. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this for hour number two. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association.
Today's show is presented by Apple Linsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Welcome back. Hour number two. Soccer Down Here, August 27th. Talking U.S. Open Cup final tonight at the Benz, 8 o'clock. Atlanta, Minnesota. Winner goes to the CONCACAF Champions League. Winner takes a trophy, the oldest trophy in American soccer. Winner also gets some cash. Good bit of cash. It's a nice uh, bonus for these two rosters that are competing for this tonight. If you're wondering what I was talking about at the end of hour number one, Mark McClure, who is the director of digital content, slash user experience for Major League Soccer. Uh, he's previously with D.C. United. He tweeted this out on Friday night, and I, I saw it when I got back to the hotel after the Atlanta-Orlando game. This was how SportsCenter led in after the Seattle-Portland game. Uh, Buchagross and, and Kenny Maine came in, and, and I believe Buchagross said to Kenny Maine something like have you been to a Sounders game and Kenny Maine said yeah fun and then said something kind of smart alecky about uh you know hold on I'll get it for you just a second said see how I held the soccer audience there soccer people you you don't know what else we have coming up for you and then went into Baker Mayfield and Cleveland and, and all that stuff which at SportsCenter they should be talking about Baker Mayfield on the eve of the the NFL season all that's fine would my question is this would you come off of a basketball football baseball game with the tone and with the mocking of the audience that just watched that game no you would nope. you never would you would never think about it if you did you'd be in the in your higher ups office immediately after the show getting reamed out for treating a partner in that way. But because it's soccer, you think you can get away with it. And oh yeah, by the way, they wouldn't do that for hockey either, for some reason. They wouldn't do that for hockey. They only do that stuff for soccer. And it drives me crazy. Because it should not be happening in 2019. And if you wonder why ratings are the way they are sometimes, well, that's why. Because... If if you watch the game, and then you're like, well, let's see what they're going to say about the game afterwards, or let's see if they cut back to you know post match interview, or just hey, I watch the game and see what else is going on in the sports world, and then you're basically mocked for being there. Well, you know, I'm just saying, like that's ridiculous. When it comes to the NBA, on the four letter. When there's a game that ends, and because they're hand in hand with the schedule maker, they can sit there and say, "Okay, well, you know, if we're in Los Angeles and it's Lakers Warriors, as soon as the Lakers Warriors coverage is over, and they go to Sports Center, nine times out of ten, what's the first thing they do? Go back to the arena for some kind of wrap up coverage that's additional to what it was before they went off the air. They have done that occasionally on MLS." And that's great when it happens. I'm not even, I want to make it clear. I'm not even asking for that. 
Not even. All it's I'm treated as a peer. For, not even that. All I'm asking for is don't insult the people who just spent two hours or in some cases four hours watching both games with your network. Don't insult them the minute the broadcast goes off the air. That's I'm not even asking to be treated like a peer. Just don't insult people. That's all. I think that's a fair ask. Nathan Pugh says, uh, your fault is in watching ESPN when they're doing anything other than actually showing the live event. Well, that's a whole different topic, and, and I know where that's going to go. I'm not going to go down that road with you, Nathan, right now. Um, I, I will tell you my history. It's actually kind of interesting right now because I've I've pulled up a book here lately to read when I've been traveling. Um, those guys have all the fun. Book came out about oh, yes. probably about 10 years ago. About James the Miller. Rise of ESPN, yeah. Um, great book to, just about sports and, and media and, and business. And I've read it before, but for whatever reason – I think it was the the Portland trip that I just needed something different to read for a long period of time because there wasn't great a oral history on the flight. Yeah, it's it's a great oral history and and reading back through some of the things that I remembered, you know, growing up. I mean, I look, I I grew up in the age of ESPN, so I know the value that it can have, and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna diminish it because it's it's incredibly important. It, it's it legitimizes whatever it puts on its air. And you know that. And everybody knows that. But what it also does is when stuff like this happens, it can delegitimize stuff. And I don't know why they would pay rights fees for a product that they're going to have their personalities trash immediately after it goes off the air. Because there is not another product that they pay rights fees for, that they would do that with. That's my frustration. And if it's something where, you know, look, they're just doing it because they feel like they can get away with it, well, then Don Garber, make some calls. Like, I, I'd be screaming. If, yep. if I watched that and said, man, what a what a great night for the league. We had two big rivalry games, lots of storylines coming out of it, lots of talking points. Cool. Figure the ratings are going to be good. Okay, good. Good night for the league. Boom, you get kicked in the gut right afterwards. I would be calling and screaming because it, it's just insulting. So that's what that's what matters here. And it's something that has to change. Lewis Martin says that people of my generation, Gen X, are usually the sportscasters in 2019. It's perceived soccer is only popular popular with millennials. Thus, a dig at soccer is a dig at millennials. It's silly. Uh, no, I don't think that's the case with these two. I, I really don't. Um, Butchagrass is a hockey guy. And yes. he, this is not the first time that he's done this with soccer and, and irked me. So it's happened with him before. Um, and I think a lot of it is because soccer is going to hurt the NHL in the long run. I think it already has in some ways. You know, the, the, it's the NHL and hockey folks that are the ones that will fight the most about, oh, it's not it's not a big five. It's, it's not a major sport. There's only a big four. Well, are, are you well really what sport has had the biggest – what sport has the biggest growth curve right now here in this country? Forget growth curve. Who's drawing more fans? Yeah. I mean, NASCAR going down. NHL thumb sideways. NHL Basketball will, will be there. what it is. It's the thing. NHL will be what it is. NHL's not going anywhere. NHL will be no. just fine. It's just NHL doesn't have room to grow. Soccer has already grown to where mm -hmm. it is at a minimum equal. Major League Soccer is, is at an equal to the NHL. It's not in terms of TV dollars coming in yet, and that's something that needs to change. And that's something that soccer has to continue to prove its worth, but part of proving its worth is not having this nonsense happen. And they need to be they need to be firm about it. I would 
I'm serious. I would be very upset if I was Major League Soccer when I saw that. Because that wouldn't happen to any other partner with, with the network. So I don't if they were if if these two had specifically made some crack about millennials or something along the line of millennials, I, I'd go along with what you're saying, Lewis, but I don't think it's like that for these two. I think you, you do still have people in positions of power, whether it's sportscasters, whether it's editors who don't have any affinity for soccer. I don't think they're thinking about it as millennials. I think they're just thinking about it in general. You, In this case, you had a hockey guy and a baseball guy. And if, if anybody is has been threatened the most by the growth of Major League Soccer, it's Major League Baseball. And that's the one that over the next 20, 25 years, well, things are going to look really, really different with those two leagues. Of course, T. Herrera maintains ESPN has been terrible since John Skipper left. And Skipper is an interesting point because Skipper was a huge soccer supporter and, and pushed the World Cup coverage to be as oh, yeah. great as it was on ESPN. Just ask Bob Lee about that. Skipper's over at DAZN now, and there's a lot of thought that he might lead them into really going after MLS when those rights become available. And then uh, Tafka's back. He says it's an egocentrism issue. Old guard disrespects soccer because it's not a traditional American, in quotes, sport. Every other sport is an American sport, even hockey to a large extent. If it's favored elsewhere in the world, there is a desire to marginalize it. Yeah, I think that used to be more of the case. Now I think it's more individuals. And, and I really I feel like these two specifically like feel threatened by it, which is silly. Because when you look at Here's the difference. That was, again, hockey guy, baseball guy coming in after a soccer game. It's soccer on my TV. When it's Scott Van Pelt, he'll have Taylor Twelman on all the time. He will go back to the the stadium and and have a segment. He will talk about the game that just ended. Uh, I believe there was... It wasn't Atlanta LAFC, but there was uh, an Atlanta game where they went straight back uh, with Van Pelt. I remember it, and I I can't remember which game it was now off the top of my head. But, yeah, Van Pelt will do it. Van Pelt gets the bigger picture. Other people just don't. And thank you, Domer, for the compliment. Uh, He says that ESPN will continue to be horrible until they make SDH a national radio show on XMFC. Okay. Well, wait a minute. That was a lot of stuff combined. So, no, no, it was. ESPN doesn't says, have ESPN XMFC. Will, no. Okay. Yeah, he he went with two separate networks in one quote. He says okay. ESPN will continue to be horrible until they make SDH a national radio show on XMFC. If ESPN can make something happen on XMFC, that'd be that'd be impressive. Yeah. I maybe. I mean, hey, I'll take a mention on two networks. Maybe they got that power. If either one wants to do it, hey, cool, we're here. It's all good. Yep. Yep. Mr. Green with a question. Okay. What do you think U.S. soccer can do in the future to maneuver its way to getting Open Cup matches on regular ESPN networks like the USL Championship has, semifinals and finals at the least? I I really think it was the contract they did this time. I don't think they had any interest in doing anything on TV because they wanted to drive everything to plus because they wanted to drive subscribers to plus. So let's see where it goes from here. Yeah. as to how this conversation goes. I think it was a strategic play by ESPN and ESPN Plus to say, you know what, here's a property. Here's a property a lot of people have wanted to watch more of. We're going to buy it. We're going to put it on our subscriber network, and we're going to raise our subscriber numbers through it. And we'll have to, I mean, I don't know if they'll be able to actually drill down to see if the Open Cup drew subscriber numbers for them. I think it has, to what degree we don't know. But now, if that's been accomplished, okay. Now you're talking about it like USL. And we'll, we'll follow up on uh, Jeff Reuter's report over at The Athletic today about USL and ESPN+. Plus. This next deal for the next three seasons is going to include more games over the air, including ESPN Deportes, than it has in the past. I would expect the Open Cup would follow that trajectory. Because they've had the final on before. 
but they didn't have the whole tournament on plus. Right. This year was a strategy. Going forward, I think you'll see games over the air, and hopefully the final will always be won, and in a game around or the semifinal, however it looks, I think we'll see more. And now Domer's petitioning for us to be on ESPN FC as well. Okay. Domer, go make it happen. Yes. I can I can follow this, Domer. Yes. Uh, Clayton Poss. Went to the Orlando game last Friday. When we were going through, we asked a security guard if the game was sold out. And she said, oh, yeah. Then we sat beside an Orlando fan and asked the same question. Ha <laughs> ha, heck no. <laughs> Man. Well, I mean, I guess the security guard was at least following the uh, whatever the instructed line was, so that's good. Yes. Here's here here is your party line and answer to all your questions. Your Q and A flow chart. Here's what you're supposed to answer. I mean, it, it's uh, not a best good news. thing. It's not a good no. thing that they're not selling out. It, it's it's not good for the league if that's the case. They will if they make the playoffs. They will if they put a better product on the field next year, which I think they will do I, I think Mauricio Pereira will make them a better team they have to score more goals they have to figure that stuff out I think they're going to be okay I, I'm not as worried about Orlando as others I think they'll be fine it's just that fan base has been burned by four years of bad soccer and hopefully now they start to see the tide turning a bit Daniel Price the best news of the morning he's out of the the meeting with the the gentleman in the long white coat. All the important bits are there for little baby Price, looking healthy, two arms and legs, fingers and toes, very happy, exclamation point. Excellent. Uh, let's see, where else are we here? There was something that I missed. Oh, um, Tafka has had a very busy morning. Okay. Stuff off the pitch. Uh-oh. So much talk about wanting to get rid of TAM, GAM, and DPs and just get a larger cap. I really don't think it's a good idea. Should it be tweaked? Sure, but these mechanisms force teams to spend in ways that benefit the squad, not just the top end. TAM does. The others not necessarily, but TAM does specifically. Tafka would be intrigued to see what would happen if low-spending teams, not naming names, (coughs) Houston, (laughs) <laughs> Colorado, close quote, uh, close parenthesis, were required to spend their TAM on acquisitions and not trades if their overall cap spend is below a certain threshold. So that sounds like he would want a floor like the NHL has. Kind of. Um, the TAM element makes it different. Um, I, I'm with Tafka in general that the, the monies are, have specific uses. TAM is the one that does. Like, if you... If you did it where GAM went into the cap, and that was just how the cap increased every year, that's fine. I'm I'm cool with that. If you had your designated player slots, um, three out of fourth one, however that looks, okay. You have your cap hit for each one. Cool, fine. All that all that's easy. TAM though specifically, it doesn't go into the cap where you can just add it into whoever you want to spend it on. Um, that way you don't have like 10 guys on minimum deals and 10 guys on high price deals. TAM makes you spend it on very specific types of people, which is good. I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how they could do this now that the Tafka's got me thinking about it. I almost wonder if you use the reserve and supplemental spots on the roster that have to be filled with certain types of players, you know, whether it's homegrown, whether it's under 23, whether whatever, whatever you want to put deeper specifications on and maybe take a little bit of the the salary limitations away or increase it to where you can sign homegrowns to bigger deals, put them there, that opens up another spot. That could be a way to to work around it and improve stuff. The 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 specifics are going to be complicated. But I think in general, what can be agreed upon is you need more money for rosters in whatever way you do it. More money available. More spots available. 
those are the two things that I think just have to happen. And if it's current system with your Gam Tam and, and all that stuff, cool. If you streamline the cap and make it easier, but you still have TAM, okay, fine. If you can find a way to make it work and streamline all of it, okay. I don't think designated players would go away. I think that part is going to be a necessity with the way you're you're going to be built because you're not going to have a cap of 50, 60 million for teams that put a bunch of money towards designated players. You know, you're not going to increase it that much. So I think designated players aren't going anywhere. You need one more of those, in my opinion. So more yeah. spots, more money available, one more designated player spot. If you can make those things happen at a minimum, I'm cool. You know, as a part of our discussion this morning on where soccer is in the landscape, Lewis Martin says that the uh, – and I'm not going to name him by name because a lot of times he just decides that he's going to say something just to – get clicks and listens and all that kind of stuff. But the gentleman that does middays on Fox sports radio already has soccer as the number four sport in the U S he combines national teams, international clubs and MLS for that number. I will say his name. I don't know why you're, you're worried about saying his name. There's far more uh, people that are more concerning with that type of stuff than, than Colin Cowherd. I mean, I don't, I don't enjoy his program, but no Colin Cowherd is, he has been open to, to talking soccer and having soccer conversation. And and if he wants to lump it all together, that's fine. I mean, I think that's maybe just the uniqueness of the sport and just how it is kind of all consuming. I, I, how did he, how did he do it again? According to Lewis, is that all domestic national teams and stuff? Or is he just talking soccer as an international sport is number four. Uh, Lewis has it as combines national teams, international clubs, and okay. MLS. So he's lumping all of it. I would say that I, I wouldn't do that, but if you talked about American soccer or North American soccer to include uh, the Canadian teams in the conversation, which would be you know Major League Soccer, USL, your national teams for both, men's and women's, if you included it as all domestic soccer, I that makes more sense to me. Like, I don't think including the Premier League or La Liga into that conversation is, is necessarily relevant. I think at this point, in terms of the sporting business landscape in the United States and Canada, it's it's a big five. You know, the NHL hasn't gone away, but soccer is in that conversation. And if you want to include the national teams into that, fine. That's cool. But I, I think MLS is in that conversation by itself. But, yeah, I mean, if you are talking sports in this country, I, I think it's just getting to a point that you can't ignore it anymore. No. And there is a uniqueness about it because you have the international elements to it. Yeah. And that that should be a bonus yeah, you should have an Americans playing abroad. Yeah, I've always felt weird about that. Um, I think sometimes it gets made a bigger deal than it should. Christian Pulisic and and Chelsea is a different conversation because and we haven't where I was seen going. to that level. You know, we we've seen Pocanegra, Dempsey, McBride. You know, in, in the Premier League, we've seen that. We've seen Tim Howard there. But right now, where the Premier League is in the U.S. landscape and the price tag that was attached to Christian Pulisic, it's a different conversation. But you're not going to start breaking down Chelsea on a weekly basis on a national radio program. You know what I mean? Like, Colin Coward's not going to start breaking down Chelsea matches. No. And he shouldn't. It doesn't. It wouldn't fit. But talking in general about the weekend in soccer in a in a Monday show or in a Tuesday show or looking ahead to the weekend in soccer in a Thursday or Friday show. It's a smart move if you're thinking about your audience. And, and that's where a show like Dukes and Bell here locally. And I've talked to Carl and Mike about this. This wasn't something that was pushed on them. This wasn't something that like I lobbied for. It wasn't something that Mike Conti lobbied for. They realized that they needed to talk about soccer on their show in the conversation of what's happening 
in, so- in sports in Atlanta. They needed to talk about it because it's what their listeners were interested in. Not everybody, because not everybody's list- interested in the Braves. Not everybody's interested in the Hawks. And believe it or not, not everybody's as interested in the Falcons or college football. But as a whole, as an, as an entire audience with a show like that, that is as big as they are, they have to talk about soccer. If they don't, they're doing their audience a disservice. And they jumped on that early on, and it's benefited them. And they will tell you that. There was a great interview with Carl, uh, with a, a national sports radio writer. And he's like, yeah, it has absolutely affected our ratings. It has absolutely affected our bottom line. And that's what people who are looking ahead, and Colin Cowherd is, is talking about it, and he's done it. So good on him. He's seeing it. I would assume he's seeing a, a value in it. So there you go. Like, the people who don't, you're, you're going to get left behind because mm-hmm. in 2026, you've got a World Cup coming here. You think it's big now. Just wait. Just wait. And if you're not on board and you try to catch up, it's not going to work. You're going to get found out. So the 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 folks that are doing that, they, they'll end up feeling the pain of it. And the folks who are looking ahead and being open-minded about it are going to benefit from it. And Lewis has linked to apparently one of the the rants or the the videos that justifies that number from Fox and the, his time at FS1. The question at the the lower third, the graphic on the lower page says, "Has soccer officially replaced hockey as a big four sport?" And he maintains, "Yes." I I wouldn't say that it's replaced it. I would say that it's joined the party. Because uh, hockey's pretty unique, and and we'll wrap this up here and and get to Doug Robertson here in just a second. Hockey's pretty unique in what it is. I think it, there's limitations on how big it can be. Like you're not gonna be massive in Atlanta, in Birmingham, Alabama, in New Orleans, because it's just not as accessible for kids to play. It's just not something you grow up with in the same way. Soccer's different. But I don't think that means hockey's going to go away. I think if the NHL is is smart and run correctly, they'll be just fine. I just don't think they're going to be any bigger than they are today. Like, grand scheme. I mean, could they make more money? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, could you do some smart business moves and make more revenue next year? Yeah. Yeah, but I think that you've maxed out on your professional teams and markets with the exception of maybe one or two, like going to quebec city or something like that and i think shoring up your flanks and being a solid 32 is where you are you're not going to go to 36 or 40 you are where you are at 30 the the biggest things that that i think are out there for hockey that would make it bigger would be a, a true world cup or if they could ever figure the olympics thing out whatever that stuff looks like the international play that would be something that could lift it a little bit, but not to where it's going to be the number three sport or the number two sport in the United States. Yeah, I think it no, is what it's not it is. Gonna, yeah, it's not going to go past baseball, football, basketball. There's no, no way. And that's fine. And soccer, I you. think, maybe could, specifically with baseball, over the next, I mean, we're, we're talking 20, 30 years. But when you look at the numbers and you look at the ages and you look at the where things are going, that maybe is is on the horizon. But they're they're in the conversation now. I think it's a big five, and I think anybody who tries to make a big point about like, oh, it's not a big four, or we're only talking big four or whatever, that's you're you're fighting a losing battle at this point. Let's take a break. Let's get Doug Robertson on the line, talk about Atlanta and Minnesota, and get ready for tonight's match and get a few predictions in for our Copa Especial, the the final. Copa Especial match of our prediction competition. Be right back after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. 
There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Soccer down here, August 27th. Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup final tonight at Mercedes-Benz. And our friend Doug Robertson was trying to get around to golf in beforehand, but he has been denied by weather. I'm sorry, Doug. That's okay. The golf course is retractable roof. <laughs> One day we will have golf courses with retractable roofs. I mean, Top Golf is available. Top Golf. There you go. That's way, way far from my house. Ah, that's so, not good. As much as I enjoy Topgolf, um, we'll be going down there. Yeah, Topgolf is great. Um, need to need to swing some clubs here soon. I really Never need play. to play. Oh, Topgolf is a blast. There, there definitely needs to be a Topgolf outing in the future. All right. Okay. Let's get into this. Final tonight, Minnesota coming to town. Minnesota bringing lots of folks with them. Uh, it's the biggest game in their club's history. How big is this for Atlanta United tonight, Doug? How do they handle this with all of the schedule compression and all the matches they've played as of late? I think that you're going to see the a lineup very similar to what you saw at Orlando. I think it's uh, the strongest possible lineup that Atlanta United can put out um, because all they got to do is win this game and they're back in the Champions League next year. And that's a, a huge goal for this team. Um I don't want to say they would rather win this than the Philadelphia game, but if I were them, I would likely rather win this than the Philadelphia game, uh, simply because it is one game and you're back in the Champions League. Um, and you get the trophy, which is also another huge accomplishment. Um, so that's what I think you're going to see tonight. When you look at the, the U.S. Open Cup run in its in its entirety, Doug, what what's it been like You know, putting away – the, the MLS games and all that kind of stuff, but specifically the Open Cup run. What's it been like to see Atlanta United, from your perspective, chase after yet another trophy for the trophy case? Because there are some teams in MLS that do not treat it with the seriousness that Atlanta United has. What's it been like to, to gauge their chasing of another trophy for the trophy case? Well, I mean, a, a lot of teams don't fill their strongest 11s when they enter in the, uh, the fourth round. Atlanta is not the only one who has done that. Tata did that. Frank did that a little bit. Um, but we just haven't had an occasion to see a lot of these teams make it deep enough where they need to put out their strongest. But it's been fun to watch Atlanta United. The game at Orlando uh, in, the, in, for the, in the semifinals was an intense game. It was a fun game. Uh, despite the the conditions, which were were not as humid as they were last week, but were pretty humid. Um, and you know, Frank, I think is doing a pretty good job here. Uh, after they 
had that meeting at Columbus a long, long time ago, kind of getting on the same page with the players and, and the results to show it. So the international spots are an issue in this tournament. Minnesota's got a far more complicated situation with that than Atlanta. Yesterday, uh, Dion Pereira was announced um, in media statements that he would not be part of the roster for today's game. Did that surprise you a little bit? Yeah, it did. Uh, told that to us on a conference call, and I, I think I was the first to tweet it out, um, along with, uh, for different reasons, Ambrose, Bello, and Kratz, who I think are going to be playing with Atlanta United, too, on Wednesday. Um but Pereira did because he started the Campionas Cup, which is the most similar game to this that Atlanta United has played in, and Pereira played well. So I thought that he would be in the lineup for this and that maybe Escobar wouldn't uh, because of his recent injury. But now Atlanta United only had six international players, and with Pereira not in the lineup and five allowed, that means the rest are. But that was surprising. So when it comes to, say, uh, a Jeff Lorenowitz or a Michael Parkhurst, uh, it's a, another opportunity for them to grab on to that, that U.S. Open Cup. When, when you have this kind of experience getting ready for the, the last game in a tournament run, do we see Lorenowitz starting Parkhurst in the 18? I know that some folks this morning on, on our Twitter have been mentioning it would be cool for uh, – Michael Parkhurst to come out saying the last 15 minutes if situation warrants that kind of thing. But what are you looking at from those two? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just I got the, you, Doug. I think John dropped off for a second. I, I, there. I did. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the Skype gremlins got me. But no, just when you have veterans like a Parkhurst and a Lorenowitz who are, are in this kind of a situation uh, to help you through – what are you looking at from them specifically when it comes to tonight and how have they been just kind of part of making sure that everybody's that even keel getting into the last match of this, of this run? I'm sorry. You dropped off again. Say that again, please. No worries. When you have the veteran presence like a Parkhurst and a Lorenowitz coming into a match like tonight, who've lifted this trophy before, what are you looking at from them when it comes to being a part of the lineup, whether it's in the 11 or the 18? I think Jeff will be in the 11 um, because he was in the 11 for the Campionas Cup. I, I assume part of that was Rometty's injury at the time, but I thought Jeff played really, really well. And really, when Jeff is in the lineup, they get a lot of shutouts. Um, I think because this is a tournament game, uh, Frank may want to be a little more conservative, even though they're at home. And having Jeff back there, I, I think, maybe gives him some comfort, some of what Tata, I guess, felt by having Jeff in the lineup a lot. Uh, Parkhurst, I don't think is going to be in the lineup. I think you might see him on Saturday, though, in Philadelphia uh, for that game. But, you know, I, I think it'd be fantastic for both players who, you know, are nearing the end of their careers to get one more trophy. Um, I think it'd be fantastic for, for Jeff and Parkhurst. When you look at Minnesota and the threat that they provide, what worries you the most about the Loons? Uh, they haven't been playing well recently. Uh, I've always kind of liked Dunlady. He's given Lenny United some issues, uh, particularly at Mercedes-Benz Stadium uh, for Minnesota. Um, they have good fullbacks who, who can get forward and get into attack. I don't know if they're going to try to bunker and get this to penalty kicks or if they're actually going to try to play with Atlanta United today. So that will determine that. Um, you know, Ike Parra has had not a lot of luck against Atlanta United. Ozzy Alonso has been, has had a fantastic career, hasn't had his best games against Atlanta United. Um, so I'm interested to see that too. But Dunlady is, uh, is the guy, and, and Vito Minone, who, who's had a fantastic season, I think, for Minnesota, is also a player that I worry about a little bit. What's your gut tell you about Minnesota? Are they going to come out guns blazing to try to put Atlanta on their heels, knowing fatigue that and schedule compression that has happened for Atlanta United recently, or do they try to 
get themselves accustomed to playing in a final? How do you see Minnesota chasing after that first 15 to 20 minutes? I think they'll try to, I, I think they'll try to weather the storm. I'm assuming, I know I, I said that Frank is likely going to may try to play it a little bit closer to the vest, but I think the players are going to come out guns blazing and try to end this quick. Um, so if Minnesota can get through those first 15, 20 minutes, similar to what Atlanta United was able to do against Orlando last week, then I think we're going to have an interesting game. Yeah, this one, I think you have two teams that can put up a bunch of goals. I, I'm not expecting a a low-scoring game here. I, I, I want to see what Adrian Heath does because when you go back to May and, and you look at the way he approached that, he played five in the back, and it's not something that he's done all season long. I think that's the only time. Maybe there was one other exception that he played three center backs. I wonder what lessons he can take from that game where he was in this building and saw this team back in May. Now, Atlanta United was different then, but what does he learn from that game? That's the the biggest question I have coming in. I think maybe the biggest thing is probably just hand on how to handle the crowd and the size of the field. I mean, it, it is a, a large, large field. A lot of opponents talk about that. I think maybe it even plays bigger than its dimensions uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so I think that that's a big part of it. And, you know, when you've done something once, twice, you do get a comfort level with it. And this will be the third time, I think, that or yeah, I think the, the third or fourth time that Minnesota's played in Mercedes-Benz now. I've lost count. I know they did once the first season. I can't remember if they did last year or not. Um, and then, it, obviously, uh, earlier this season. Yeah, this is number three. Number three. Okay, so they didn't last year. Okay. Yeah, so you get a comfort level with it and, and a familiarity, and, and that helps calm the nerves, too. So when it comes to Atlanta United and the anticipated 11 that you have, if you haven't released it, I know that we can certainly plug that you will put out your anticipated 11 fairly soon. No, I, I did. I did about an hour and a half ago. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. Aha. Uh-huh. So when it comes to the 11 and the 18, give me somebody who isn't someone that we instantly gravitate toward that you're looking forward to watching tonight that will have an impact in the match. I don't think there is that player. I think you're going to see a lot of the familiar faces. Um, I guess the closest would probably be the Viaba. Um, if the game is, is close him coming off the bench in the second half uh, to try to make an impact because he, he hasn't gotten a lot of playing time in a long, long time. And I know he's the type of player that if he's not starting, you know, it, it uh, he gets wound up. Um, so I'm curious to see if he's going to get an extended run tonight. Yeah, he's the one that you just wonder where his fitness is. He, he's a, a player who you'd love to have in a game like this. I, I felt like coming out of Orlando on Friday that, you'd be looking for a spark here in the lineup. And, and I thought maybe that would be Dion Pereira. But Tito would absolutely be that if he can get you, I mean, into the second half. And, and we just haven't seen him play any extended minutes in a long time. I, I agree, though. I think he would be the one. If, if he's available, I'd find a way to get him into the starting lineup. Well, I, I think he's available. I, I... Well, available to start, I, I guess, would be the way I would say. I, I don't, I don't quite understand the fitness thing because he's been training now for three weeks or so. Um, so he's he's got to have game legs at this point. I, I don't know if he's not going to get extended minutes with Atlanta United. Why he's not getting them with Atlanta United too, just to get some time. Um, it, it's it's an interesting situation to me. He would be a a useful player in a final like this tonight because of, of what he brings to the table and just that that spark that he can give and that's my biggest concern I mean, you coming saw out of Orlando is the the kind of flatness at times you know you'd love to have something different tonight. You saw him uh, create all sorts of chances against Orlando. He, he mm-hmm. could have had an assist 
on a Joseph goal and he passed up a chance to take a shot himself um, one time and he put one wide of the post at another. Um, yeah, the flatness in Orlando, I, I think the team was exhausted. They, they said as much when mm-hmm. Joseph Martinez gives an excuse or not an excuse, I'm sorry, but a factual statement that he told the guys at the hotel he was tired before the games even played, then you know the team is just worn out. Um, but Frank said they looked really good yesterday. They'll be up for this game, obviously. I think if you see any effects of the fatigue, it will be Saturday at Philadelphia. Um, and really, all that, you know, I, well, I know that they got to stay ahead of NYCFC, but even a draw is, is going to be a good result at Philadelphia on Saturday. Do we get into predictions now? Let's do this. So, for those of you out there listening, you can join in by voting in Josh Bailey's Bailey Daily poll, J Bailey eighty six on Twitter, presented by Appalinsky and Associates. It's the final match of our Copa Especial, which is everything other than regular season play and playoff play. This is our predictions from Concacaf, our predictions from the U.S. Open Cup. Our Campeones Cup prediction fell into this category, and this is the final one. John, you want to kick us off? Well, considering that Josh is in the lead and he picked the uh, Velvet Driving Slipper Lock of the Week score, kind of have to be a little different and if we're going to try to get over the top. So I'm going to go 3-1 Atlanta United because Josh picked the Nelson 2-1 standard. Okay. Yeah, you got to find a win somehow. All right. Got to jump him in the standing somehow, and I don't All think right. it's going to be one nothing, and I can't say, and I think that Minnesota is going to get one, so it can't be two if I'm going to beat Josh, so I'm going to say three. Okay. Doug, what do you think? My black velvet driving slipper lock of the week is <laughs> <laughs> Two to nothing, Atlanta United. I think you need to find whoever makes the uh, black velvet driving slippers and, and get a sponsor, Doug. Uh, I think that would be a good way for us. Alfani, you got John's got to do that. He's the one that wears them around proudly That's in the true, stadium. But you, but you make the lock of the week <laughs> prediction every week, so I want to get your son. Uh, driving I've slipper lock of the week recently in proof that even the dumbest of people can sometimes get fortunate. <laughs> um okay so two nil Jarrett goes two nil as well uh our friend from soccer over there nick Alifi, is always the negative nelly of the bunch he's staying two one minnesota um so at him at nick Alifi, and yell at him as yes much as you at want to. soc over there and uh, nick Alifi, like no call him out by name um for me three one is what i said to people yesterday uh, i'm sticking with that I, I think atlanta gets an early goal and i think they are in control of this early on. Minnesota pulls one back in the second half and and makes a game of it, but Atlanta finds a third to put it away, and it's a 3-1 win for Atlanta. I'm going to say goals by... Hmm. Tito gets one. There you go. Um, Barco Mirror. gets one. And I think it's going to be... Miles Robinson on a set piece. Oh, there you go. That's my predictions. All right, Doug, what Very else do you have nice. coming up over at the AJC? Uh, I'm going to be laying low for the rest of the day. Um, but then tonight you'll get uh, Atlanta United starting 11 as soon as it comes out. I've already put out my predictions at Doug Robertson AJC on Twitter. Um, you'll have the game story as soon as that final whistle blows. You'll have the player ratings. You'll get a Southern Fried Soccer podcast. And hopefully uh, there'll be some interesting subplots uh, that I can write about as shorter stories that will appear either later tonight or uh, tomorrow morning. I'm taking my daughter out for breakfast for her birthday, her 17th birthday in the morning. Um, So I'll probably write one or two stories after I do that. Uh, Big, big day for her. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Doug, we'll be seeing you at the Benz tonight. Uh, I'll talk to you on Southern Fried as well after the match. All right, guys. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye. See you there. Thanks, Doug. We're going to take our final break here. We'll be back with any final questions you guys have. Tweet at us at Soccer Down Here. 
We'll be right back. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here, August 27th. A little bit of soccer over there, overlap. Um, if you were with us on last night's show, we talked at the end of it about the situations of Bolton and Bury in the EFL, the third division of English football. And Bolton is up against a deadline of, what, a little over an hour where Bolt, you know, Bolton and Bury both noon noon Eastern. Both of them are at noon Eastern. Okay, I thought one was later, yep. but no, nope, both at have, noon Eastern apparently. Okay, well now you have a situation where Bolton really didn't look like there was any answers coming. Bury had a deadline last week that they got a reprieve because it looked like they had a buyer. Well, that buyer has pulled out, and the EFL made a statement um, about five minutes ago. The league continues to be in discussions with Bury FC in advance of today's 5 p.m. deadline and will provide a further update as appropriate. Uh, Rob Harris tweeted that CNN Sporting Risk has pulled out of a takeover of the League One club, which now faces being expelled from the league. So you could have two teams kicked out of the third division in England because um, they don't have any money. And this hasn't happened don't think it's ever happened, not in the middle of no. the season. No. But look, realistically, when you start looking around, this is not going to be a rare occurrence. And that's a shame. Um, you have clubs with a ton of history who might cease to exist today because of just ridiculously bad management. And I think a thought that they were too big or too old to fail. Well, it's not true. And you have a lot of fans who are going to suffer because of it. And then there's a piece of video that has cycled through on social media from Burry's official account. The EFL had told both of these clubs, look, you know, we can't wait any longer. You guys can't, you know, you can't not play for a double negative. And so in preparation for what would have been a match this weekend, you had a lot of volunteers from the community and from other clubs show up at the home ground of Bury and help clean the place up. I mean, literally, you've got people there in gloves with Windex and cleaning off of seats and picking up garbage. I mean, it's, it's 
great video and great to see that kind of community involvement, but it looks like we're about an hour and six minutes away from two teams being wiped off the planet. And uh, if you haven't been reading David Kahn's stuff from The Guardian, uh, it has been must-read material all the way through, and we talked about it last night on Soccer Over There. But, yeah, this is an absolute shame, and apparently the EFL knew about the financial problems of these two teams and others and just kind of sat. And so read David Kahn's stuff if you're into this kind of thing, but it's, it's a sad day and it, uh, it's a sad day right now and it could be even worse in a little over an hour. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously they had to know something and they allowed the season to start with the situation and now you're just going to affect everybody in the league and everybody in the league below it. And just the whole situation is a mess because of just mismanagement on a number of different levels. Coming back to MLS, the uh, website 538 has their playoff predictions, playoff projections out for the, the league now. And look, teams have anywhere between five and eight games remaining, so it's not exactly 100% equal. But 538 pretty good with their projections this is what they've got so far atlanta nyc philadelphia 99 percent chance or greater of making the playoffs okay done that should be the your top three seeds atlanta and nyc same odds to be the top dog in the east 45 percent philadelphia 10 percent so they don't know who's going to end up at the top of the east the next group red bulls 91 percent to make the playoffs Toronto, 71%. New England, 67%. Okay. I'm a little surprised that uh, Toronto is that high, but... Yeah. mm -hmm. DC, 61%. That's dropped a lot. Montreal, 59%. Then it really drops. Orlando, 29%. Chicago, 14%. Out West... LAFC obviously projected to win the Supporter Shield. We already know that. Make the playoffs, all of it. Next two, Real Salt Lake, Seattle, both at 94% to make the playoffs. LA Galaxy, 93%. After that comes Portland at 82% to make the playoffs. Then it's San Jose at 74, Minnesota at 73, Dallas at 70 Sporting Kansas City is listed at a 19% chance of making the playoffs. Houston, Vancouver, Colorado, all 1% or worse. So it's starting to narrow a little bit, but you see in some of those groupings how tight it's going to be over the last month of the season. I still think D.C. is the one that falls out of it from the East. That's my gut, and especially with all of the uh, player questions. Well, if they fall out, who who falls in? Uh, oh, let's see. I'm trying to think of. Uh, so DC falls out. So Atlanta in, Philadelphia in, NYC in, yep. Red Bulls in, yep. Revolution. Yep. Montreal. Do you get I'll no, say Montreal you, goes in. So you think Montreal goes in, D.C. goes out? No Orlando. Yeah, I think Montreal's your eight. Everybody slides up one. Okay. What about out west? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I think that Portland – I think Portland's in. I think Dallas is out. I think it comes down to the last day of the season. No Kansas City? No Kansas City. I don't think it – I don't think they're – I mean, six points back right now, 27 in the barn – and Dallas, I think, has only, what, six to play? And Timbers with two matches in hand, I think they make that up. And yes. I think that Dallas is in, Sporting is out, Portland is in. Okay. All right, you look at the upcoming schedule. Montreal plays Vancouver at Stad Saputo tomorrow night. If they win, they will have five games left, and they would be equal with Toronto on the seven spot. They'd actually go ahead of them on wins, uh, but Mo- Toronto would have two games in hand. When you look at the weekend coming up, Red Bulls play Colorado at Red Bull Arena. That should look like three points for them. 
Chicago goes to Columbus in, in a must win for the fire. Montreal, second game of the week, they host D.C. Not a must win for D.C., but they're going to get an opportunity to face a team that played on Wednesday. That should help them. That's a massive game in the Eastern Conference. Another one is New England hosting Toronto. That's huge. Those two are going to go a long way in defining what the Eastern Conference table looks like going into the international break. Atlanta going to Philadelphia. Dallas gets Cincinnati coming to town. That's a good one for Dallas to pick up three points. Sporting Kansas City gets Houston coming to town. That's a good one for Sporting to pick up three points. A maybe kind of tricky game for NYC. They go to Vancouver. Yeah, we've seen what Vancouver can do. Maybe, as a city, not as a club. Yeah, Maybe that's a tricky one. Portland hosts RSL. That's a big one out west on Saturday night. San Jose hosts Orlando. That's a tough one for Orlando where they need points in the worst way. And then on Sunday, Seattle hosting the LA Galaxy. Big one in the middle of the Western Conference. And LAFC hosting Minnesota. If Minnesota can get anything out of that, they'll be very, very happy. Mm -hmm. Big, big games across the board. And, And there's a couple during the international break that are going to be very tricky for teams like Toronto going to Cincinnati on September 7th, NYC and New England on September 7th, Orlando and LAFC on September 7th, Seattle going to Colorado on September 7th, Portland and Kansas City on September 7th. That's a day after U.S.-Mexico you're going to have some teams missing players in critical matches during that international break. We'll get into that. Lots of of stuff to get into as we get closer, and uh, you're going to have some upset fan bases. You're going to have some upset managers and missing pieces going into those big games in that week. But tonight, it's all about the Open Cup. It's all about the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. It's a big night for American soccer. Hopefully the match lives up to the spectacle that it should have. You can watch on ESPN+. Plus. It looks like their pre-match coverage is going to start at 7.30. John Champion and Taylor Twelman on the call. Devin Kerr will be on the sidelines. Mike Conti and I will be with you in pre-match on 92.9 The Game, starting at 7 o'clock. We'll be back after the ESPN Plus coverage concludes on 92.9 The Game until 11 or 12, depending on on how things work. So we will be with you to set the table. We will be with you afterwards to talk about what happened. You can watch the match on ESPN Plus. You can get a ticket and come down to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It is a cup final. It should be an intense atmosphere, and it's a game that Atlanta United needs to win. I think they they want this win because they want CONCACAF. They want another trophy for the shelf. And they want to continue to establish themselves as the the bellwether club in Major League Soccer. And an Open Cup win in year three following an MLS Cup win and following a Campiones Cup win would go a long way in doing that. We'll be back tomorrow to wrap all of it up on an overreaction Wednesday. Haven't had many of those. We've had a couple. This will be another one. We'll talk all the Open Cup final stuff coming out of it, and we'll start to look ahead at the upcoming weekend in Major League Soccer. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We appreciate it. Thanks for all the interaction this morning on Twitter. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata.